Hello, Fit Fam. Welcome to another episode of the Fit Doc Michelle Reed Podcast. Our guest is none other than Richard Smith, who is a cardiologist. We're going to talk about how do you prevent heart disease. He specializes in non-interventional cardiology, so that means he tries to do everything possible so you don't have to have surgery. And what I like about Dr. Smith, who I have known for maybe close to over 20 years, is that he's not just a cardiologist. He's also a marathon runner. He's a triathlon. He is a musician and he is a writer. So all things that I love to do. So, but before we jump in and get started talking to him, we are now finally into November. Can you believe it? It is almost the end of 2023. Where did it go? <laughs> Today's hot topic is diabetes. November is Diabetes Awareness Month. And it's really important that we talk about diabetes because there's over 80 million people out there who are pre-diabetic. So as a diabetic, you know, doesn't mean it's a life or a death sentence, but it's a certain way that you have to change your life because diabetes can be genetic. But the good thing is there are certain things that we can do to control our glucose. And you know, one of them is, of course, exercising. Of course, you know, that comes from the fit doc, but trying to maintain a healthy life, try to lose any type of excess weight and eat healthy, have healthy food choices that will help to lower your blood sugar. One of my favorites is, of course, oatmeal. Oatmeal does not cause a spike in your glucose level as fast as some other things, if, as if you were to have some ice cream to eat instead, or um, what do you call it, like a sugary uh, cereal to eat. So it's about modification and lifestyle changing. And that way, it'll help to lower your body's sensitivity to insulin. But remember, try to get at least 30 minutes of exercise a day because you know that what we've been pushing every day for our challenges. Sorry, I didn't come up with one for November, but you know what? You just keep doing what you did in October and you'll see a big change by the time we get to the end of the year because we're almost there. Now, let's hop on to our interview with Dr. Richard Smith. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking me to do this. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, you know, I had to have my favorite cardiologist on. That's very sweet. Don't tell anyone I said that, though. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've known each other for over 20 years. So we do have a special relationship because you are also my cardiologist. And people think like, oh, my gosh, is Dr. Reed dying now? Dr. Reed found out, you know, a couple of years ago, she had mitral valve prolapse. And, you know, and of course, when I went through COVID, COVID actually affected my heart. And one of the things that I did experience was that increased heart rate that would just come all on its own. And, of, you know, of course, just eventually just go away by itself. So you are my favorite cardiologist, no matter what. <laughs> So with that being said, we always ask our guests, what is a little known fact that I might not know about you? And maybe most people probably don't know about you. Oh, my gosh. You, get, you just gave it all away in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, but you didn't mention skiing. I love to ski. So I try to make sure at least once a year I get out to uh, breathe some fresh mountain air anywhere in the world. Um, and um I try to find a very challenging mountain and hopefully hit a day when there's a lot of fresh snow powder. And that's okay. my dream for the for the you know for the winter. Oh, very good. So you probably already have your trips lined up for the winter time for this year coming up. No, no, I can't. <laughs> I, can't I have to reveal that my wife is a leap year baby, and uh, this is a leap year coming up. And and February 29th is right around ski season. My wife kind of retired from skiing, so. I have to make a little choice to have a, a leap year birthday party and maybe hold off a little skiing this time. Okay, so right off the year, it's not going to be about you. It's going right. to be about you and her together. So that's, that's perfect. Right. That's right. <laughs> so jumping right in, what exactly is non-interventional cardiology? Well, you sort of were spot on when you said trying to prevent 
um, patients from having surgery, um, but that also includes other interventions like stents and um, uh, invasive procedures. So we try our best to work at the preventative level to try to prevent heart disease from progressing because many of us have heart disease at an early point because it's, it is age related, um, but we're trying to prevent the progression where it gets to the point where we have an acute event, an episode where we need immersion treatment and we try to prevent that from, from happening. All right. So since we're in November and we talked about diabetes earlier, what is the relationship or the correlation that you see between diabetes and heart disease? Wow. Um, you could even take it uh, one step back and say even pre-diabetes. So the, the relationship is that these are diseases that affect um, the progression of vascular disease. Um, and the vascular disease, in the beginning, it doesn't really affect the heart itself, but it affects the circulatory system, the, the blood vessels. And so when the uh, plaque, which is the cholesterol, when it starts to um, stick to the wall of the artery and form uh, thickening in the walls, um, that, that those things can go on for many years. And the, the rate of progression of that, uh, how quickly this will occur, is a function of many things. And injury to the arteries occur when you're when you have uh, poor glycemic or poor sugar control. So pre-diabetes is a risk, and as well as as diabetes itself. And also those conditions increase the risk of inflammation. Uh, inflammation meaning the risk of clots, which are make it more likely to have an, an acute event, which means a stroke, a heart attack, etc. So now, do a stroke and a heart attack present the same in a woman as opposed to a man? A great question, as always. Um, it, sometimes the classic symptoms are the same, um, but um, in women, uh, for various reasons, um, and there are complex reasons, some of it's psychosocial, some of it is the way you know, we're conditioned with society to, um, women always seem to, Put themselves last, as you know, as moms, as spouses, as as, as hard workers, and often they ignore symptoms, um, thinking that it's uh, heart disease is a man's disease, and and um, and so that it can present present later. But also keep in mind that women have smaller arteries, just as they have smaller uh, muscles, um, and so uh, a a a forty percent blockage in a female is still forty percent, but if the artery is smaller, um, it might be easier for, for that to cause a problem if, if it progresses. And women also have uh, the luxury of having uh, horm hormones. And so during their um, time of uh, active, uh, menstru uh, active menstruation with mm -hmm. estrogen, they're, they're protected from heart disease. So when they become menopausal, after menopause, they start to catch up to men. So there's that 10 year uh, lag time. And mm -hmm. after that, they're, they're, it's fair game. This, this heart disease becomes a lot more common. Um, but, in, but like you said before about uh, chest pain, symptoms may be a little bit different in women. They may have more of a, a, a discomfort. They may have vague, more vague symptoms. So it, it, that, there's a lot been studied about that as well. So symptoms can be different and also can be unrecognized. Yeah, because a lot of times, like in my female patients, they'll say that they just felt tired not really even short of breath, just extremely tired and exhausted. And they kept overlooking it, overlooking. And then eventually they started having like chest pain or shortness of breath. So when we're seeing these things, a lot of times we think, oh my gosh, I'm just stressed. I'm overworked. So are you seeing a correlation between stress and the increase in heart disease, especially now that's going on post COVID? Yeah, well, that's COVID is a whole new uh, can of worms <laughs> because COVID itself it, uh, causes um, increase in inflammation and probably uh, vascular effects that can last uh, uh, days, weeks, months, maybe even years. So mm -hmm. that's the actual risk of uh, increased risk of stroke and heart attack after COVID itself. And then there's just the uh, the risk of the stress and the anxiety that comes along with it and, mm -hmm. and dealing with loss of work and, 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 and just concerns that you're going to give it to family members and all those psychosocial issues. 
So, the, so yes, the, the the risk of stress is is, is real. And and if you look at the uh, American College of Cardiology guidelines for prevention, I believe they put stress as like number one. So the, the doctors should always identify at every uh, visit psychosocial stressors that may be increasing the patient's risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I know a couple of times, like I've had patients that I've had referred to you or to the practice that it seems like it's the anxiety that they're going through and it could be um, a panic attack. And sometimes that's what it is, but then there are right. a few chances where that's not what it is. So is there a way that you suggest that not even as a woman, but just as people in general that we sort of know that, okay, you know what, this is normal, but this right here is not normal. How do we get people to differentiate between that? I, I think, um, well, first of all, any kind of symptoms that persist should, should be evaluated. Um, and there's also the duration of the symptoms, um, as well as the characteristics. So if something is, uh, is going on for, for a very, very long time, and uh, week after week, month after month, obviously you, you need an evaluation. But the red flag should also be in the individual episode. So if something is very, very short, lasting for only a second, um, especially if it occurs with a movement or taking a deep breath, um, you're uh, bending over, changing posture, and it's only for a second, that's unusual. It's unusual for that to be heart, heart related. Um, so you're talking something that's more than a few seconds, typically. And um, if it's longer than a few seconds, then it becomes a few minutes or, or, or and especially if it's exertional, right? So if it's happening with exertion, um, and if it's associated with other more severe symptoms, uh, cold sweats, um, nausea, you feel like you're going to pass out, or you feel your heart racing, um, mm-hmm. that, that's certainly concerning. And so um, everyone gets a skipped heartbeat every now and then. You feel something mm-hmm. skipped, and you can evaluate it and, and have it checked out. Often it will be nothing. But if it's, if it's increasing and it's, it's prolonged, certainly it deserves a, an evaluation. Okay. And now we talk about heart health. So what are some of the things besides running marathons like us, what are some of the things that we can encourage our patients to do to keep their heart as healthy as possible? Um, Well, you you sort of started your program with that uh, at a half hour every day uh, and and, uh, joining your, joining you for these exercise programs. Um, That's the best way. Um, it's really just movement, uh, just keeping yourself active. Mm-hmm. The guidelines suggest uh, 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. And moderate means a fast walk, more than just walking around. I mean, a lot of patients will come in and they'll say they're active, they're standing all day doing things, but they're not really getting their heart rate up. So mm-hmm. yes, it's better to be walking around and counting your steps uh, than to be sedentary, but you wanna try to have dedicated time where you're exercising uh, ideally a half hour at a time of mod- at a moderate uh, intensity and doing that for um, typically 150 minutes a week, five days a week, a half hour is very good. But if you're uh, someone like us <laughs> um, and you want to do more vigorous exercise, uh, you can decrease that to 75 minutes a week. So if you're, if you're swimming laps, if you're, if you're jogging, if you're uh, doing cycling you know, more than uh, 10 miles an hour, um, that's considered vigorous exercise, and you could say, okay, I'm only doing it 75 minutes. But that doesn't mean in the other days you should you should do nothing. So mm-hmm. the days that I'm not doing vigorous exercise, I'm I'm always uh, stretching. So yoga, uh, you know, we want to be able to to stand and walk, and and balance is very important. So so now the recommendations are for everyone as they age to work on balance every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something you can do daily, working on your balance uh, to make sure that you can. Get up from the ground. That's really important that we forget about that. You can get up from the ground and we take it for granted. You know, so you just gave me an idea that maybe we could do that for like TikTok. Have you seen the ones where someone's on the ground and then they get up and they don't use their hands? It can be hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great TikTok idea. You, me, try and do that. We'll practice before we film it. We can also practice balance, right? Uh, like standing on one leg and then closing your eyes. I mean, that's almost impossible. But I'm trying to, you know, give us, you know, something a little nudge because 
I've done what three marathons. The last time I did the New York City Marathon, you were there on what First Avenue, I think. With yes, the uh, First Avenue on Seventy Second Street. Yes. Oh my gosh, that gave me life. Um, but you've gone a little further than me because you're also um, a triathlete. Yes, but I I don't do Ironman, so I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a total lunatic. <laughs> 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 but um. But you know, you never know. Uh, you know, because as, as you get older and you feel uh, you have a little bit more time, sometimes um, you can do these endurance sports at a lower intensity. And and I think cross training is there's something to it. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I like about the balance of, of cross training because too much running, uh, too much on your knees. But you but if you just if you only swim, which is sometimes hard to coordinate getting to mm -hmm. a pool, but you need to do some weight bearing, right? So you need to do something stationary bike, cycling, um, whatever you prefer. Elliptical is good. Um, so cross training is good because then you don't do too much of one thing and, and you balance out your muscle groups. I always, I always say to my friends and my patients, look at the physiques of, of a rip marathon runner. Sometimes they look frail even. And then look at the physique of a swimmer and they look like too top heavy, right? Mm -hmm. But then you look at the physique of a triathlete, they look normal, like normal people. Like yes. and they're and they're 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 amazing athletes. Or or like a soccer player, right? So they're they're extremely fit uh, because they because it's they're balanced. Mm -hmm. So I guess the overall take home message is find some type of exercise that you like to do, move for at least 30 minutes every day. That helps, you know, a lot incorporate more balance into your life, especially because you and to improve your flexibility, because as you get older, it does get harder to move, to bend, to pick up things. And not everybody wants to walk around their entire life with all their bones cracking. But um, whatever it is that you can do to be active, I think that would be perfect. And now as a physician, we didn't touch on you as a musician and also a writer. So if you could just quickly tell us where you are with those two projects, those two added additions to your lifestyle. Well, thank you for the thank you for that because um, it's I, I always enjoy talking about that. Um, so writing um, is, is is like a, is like a life part of my life, like exercise. Um, I, I I try to do it every day, and believe it or not, if I'm if I'm not at home to do it, I'll, I dictate all the time, and then I upload it later. Um, but this, I don't know if you know this, um, November is National Novel Writing Month. They call it NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. So every year there are thousands of people in all cities trying to plug out a novel from November 1st to November 3rd, just write a full you mm -hmm. know, draft every day as much as you can. Um, but So I'm working on finishing a novel this November. Um, Congratulations! Yes, yeah, so thank you, thank you. But it's something I've been working on for many years, and it, all my writing has a little bit of a medical twist. Um, and um, I do have a website you can see my short stories. But anyway, uh, this is, that's a separate issue. I don't know if you link these things. Um, as far as music goes, um, I like to sometimes combine um, uh, original music with poetry, or with I've done it before with heart sounds and uh, um, patient interviews. Um, but um, so it's more of a, a tool to express my uh, poetry or writing. Good. So what we'll do is if you want um, now, you can just tell us how to reach you if somebody's looking for a cardiologist and then also um, how people can reach you if they would like to follow you as far as your writing and also your music because you do do concerts. <laughs> I don't know if I would call it that. <laughs> okay, uh, shows, okay, we're we're not booking you at MSG, <laughs> but you know you are doing you know local shows. Okay, okay. So, um, if you want to contact me, it's best to just contact my uh, medical office in uh, Carl Place um, through the, our our central phone number, which is five one six. Eight seven seven zero nine seven seven. Um, my professional email at Mount Sinai, which is our main uh, hospital, our, our father hospital, is uh, Richard Smith two at Mount Sinai org. That's my professional email. Um, my writer's website is Richie, so my writing name is Richie Smith because I don't want to confuse the writing and the uh, the, the medical. So mm -hmm. Richie R I C H I E Smith. 
Um, and then the word writer, W-R-I-T-E-R dot -E com. That's my writer's website. Um, and then the music, uh, it is linked to SoundCloud. So um, I have a, a SoundCloud page with some a little bit of music on there and um, some other links. Um, that's Rich. Uh, that's also Richie Smith. That's on uh, SoundCloud. All righty. Well, Dr. Richard Smith, we thank you so much for being on the Fit Doc Michelle Reed podcast. I won't say I'm looking forward to running another marathon with you, but we might consider it a 5K in the future. Matter of fact, I'm going to be doing a turkey run and a jingle bell run. That sounds amazing. And I, and I still never did the airport run with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So maybe we can um, get that going and um, plan to do that because I believe it should be either the end of March or the beginning of April. I think it would be fun to run with you on a runway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too bad we wouldn't be boarding a plane. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Dr. Reed, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you in the, uh, outside and inside the, the medical establishment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Bye, everyone. So my next segment is in real life. So you always hear me talking about exercising. Yeah, you knew the boys, you know, the twins play basketball. Um, all through from elementary school, all the way through high school. But you might never known that I used to have them do bike rides in the morning before they went to school. And if it was summertime or the weekend, it would be a longer ride. And our long rides could be anywhere from 10 to 15 miles um, before I headed to work. And we really enjoyed those times. And you know, I think that made them stronger people because that also helped to develop a certain work ethic where they knew that it was important to go to school, but they also knew the importance of respecting their body. So one thing that I am enjoying is watching both of them in college now and how they are really sharing their routine, um, sometimes more publicly than other times, as far as um, my son, Stephen, he is at Carnegie Mellon, and he is highlighting almost every day his exercise routine. So while I'm still in bed sleeping, he is usually up and has already posted his exercise routine for the day. And Stephen, I mean, Marcus, who is at McDaniel, um, he is now um, playing intramural basketball, but he started off like continuing his routine of going to the gym um, in between classes, which I think that's really good. So that shows that we are truly being a fit doc family. And you might remember, you might be asking about Mr. Kershaw Scott. He has been going to the gym more times than me, um, really putting in the work, has lost some weight, some, gotten some definition as far as his muscle tone. So go fit family. We are practicing what we preach. So I encourage you to encourage your family members to get out there to be healthy because we heard about what can happen to your heart, but we also talked about how to prevent things. And one of the things that was at the top of that list was exercise and changing how we eat. So go out there and get those healthy food choices. And most of all, drink your water and get your rest. So thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for being on the Fit Doc Michelle Reed podcast. Please continue to like, share, and like again, and share with your family and your friends the information that you learn on the podcast. And if you have any topics that you want me to talk about, make sure you reach out to me. Have a great time until we see each other again on our next episode.